Hi, I'm Jerry Besson and welcome to Land of Beginnings and welcome to Whitehall. John Ewell Lewis, famous architect of another time, had to say that Whitehall appears as though cut from one large block of stone. And in a very real sense, Whitehall stands on the highway of our national life as a very significant monument because many things have passed by and through Whitehall over the last 200 years or so the Trinidad has been developed. Come with me this afternoon and I will show you a little bit of Whitehall. During the indeterminable wars that have afflicted my country, I have served the cause of freedom. For 13 years, my comrade in arms, Pascal Paoli, has defied the despots of Genoa, who claim to possess our island home. Now Corsica, the beloved, has been sold by them to the French, and we must renew the war. It was the end of April 1769 when General Divo scattered our heroic land and Pascal Pauli allowed himself to be carried away to England. We will rebuild our Corsica and raise another generation of sons and await his return. Corsica was at war with the journeys towards the end of the 18th century. This was a terrible conflict. It was, in fact, a conflict for the survival of the people of Corsica. Towards the end of that period of time, the throne of France fell to the revolutionaries. Corsica was on the verge of becoming part of the Republic of France. At that point in time, it was virtually handed over to the British. As a result of this, many people from the island of Corsica came to Trinidad. Their names are still with us. Franceschi. Gianetti, Agostini, Giuseppe, all these people came to Trinidad and formed part and parcel of the fabric of our national life. Towards the end of his reign, Louis XVI, at the urgings of the patriots of the Corsican Wars, did name Pascal Paoli governor of the wildly beautiful Mediterranean island. Within months, the revolution had swept the Bourbon from the throne of France, and rather than let the island fall into the hands of the revolution, Pauli allowed the British to take it in 1794. Within three years, on the other side of the world, another island changed hands. Trinidad became a British possession. It was just about this period that the Corsican immigration to Trinidad commenced. Trinidad, the fortunate country that it is, has been possessed of several economies over the years. The cocoa economy was by far and away the most significant economy. It was an economy that touched the lives of more Trinidadians, more people, high and low, black and white, rich and poor, were touched by the cocoa economy that came into existence in the 1860s and 70s. The cocoa economy came into existence largely because of the collapse of the old sugarcane plantation economy. When the old plantation economy came to an end with the abolition of slavery, it meant the ruin of the French Creole sugar planters. A generation later, they were able to bounce back by going further into the forest, deeper into the mountains, and develop cocoa with the help of the Coco Piles. This house that we are standing in here was built by the last of the great Coco Barons. It was built by Leon Agostini. Leo, Leon Agostini and his father had come from Corsica in the 1870s. They were in fact relatives of the capitulant Don Simon Agostini who had come about a hundred years before. Don Simon Agostini was a capitulant and one amongst the first to take the oath of allegiance to the King of England. There are many families of Corsican descent in Trinidad today. 
Simon Agostini became the proprietor of several sugar estates and prospered, but suffered the vicissitude of the economic collapse in the period after the emancipation of the slaves. It was the succeeding generation that rebuilt the family fortune, this time with cocoa, the golden bean. The Maya regarded cocoa as a drink of the gods, and it was reserved for the high nobility of this empire that once existed in the cloudy mountaintops of the Andes. South America's great jungles with their vast river systems of the Orinoco and the Amazon are the true home of the golden bean. In Trinidad, cocoa has been cultivated since Spanish times with varying degrees of success. After the abolition of slavery and the collapse of the French planters' cane economy, the planters turned to cocoa cultivation to save the day. In the 1840s, when the nearly bankrupt planters who were by now in their second generation moved deeper into the valleys of the northern range, Grand Coover and the Montserrat Hills, cocoa was only moderately successful. But little did those cocoa pioneers know how right their timing was. Within another decade, cocoa became a staple in Trinidad's export market. Cocoa is a different crop than sugar. Whereas cane is only viable with vast acreages, people with small plots of land were able to participate in cocoa cultivation. The effect this had on the structure of the society was very positive. The middle classes of all races became very comfortable, if not wealthy. Country people, the Hispanic Amerindian population, also benefited from the cocoa economy, clearing the forest and cultivating the cocoa fields with loving care. The Industrial Revolution and the emergence of Europe's middle class with its predilection for the final things of life served to create a very large market for cocoa and chocolate. For nearly three quarters of a century, the Afro-Franco Creole culture, together with its older Coco Payol cousinage, boomed. Many small and medium businesses blossomed as a result of exporting cocoa and importing and distributing goods. Many families of the colored lower and middle classes were able to own small cocoa estates, live comfortably, educate their children, and maintain the values and morals of that respectability so vital to colonial life in those years. In fact, the cocoa boom is what is referred to as the good old days, the long time days of the collective memory of Trinidad as it has come down to us over the years. And this was good old Trinidad land of the sugarcane and the cocoa pod, where the Gantums spoke only to the Divatai and the Divatai only to God. In Port of Spain and the other main towns, development became increasingly apparent. New neighborhoods came into existence. One could even say that the pretty little gingerbread houses of Woodbrook, Belmont, in San Fernando, south of the Paradise Cemetery, moving towards Rushworth Street at St. Joseph and in Arima, came about as the result of the Golden Bee. Coco served to develop Trinidad in those years in a variety of ways. New villages came into existence with schools, churches, chapels, Masonic lodges and friendly societies, post offices and warden's offices, markets and shops. Old towns like Arima and Sangre Grande, Princess Town and San Fernando became active, busy and prosperous. The island's population moved out of the original centers of settlement which had formed after emancipation. There was prosperity too in the countryside. A new verve in the folk arts of the patois speaking people expressed itself in dance and song. For the first time, it became possible for people of all races and combinations of races to enjoy the benefits of the economy.
During the rebirth of the French and Corsican family fortunes in the 1850s, the relatives of Don Simon came to Trinidad to seek their fortune. Amongst these was a young man by the name of Joseph Leon Agostini. His father became a cane farmer in the Oropuch area of South Trinidad. Joseph Leon was sent to Germany for his education and upon his return joined the firm of Henry Watt and Company. He later became a partner of André Ambar and Son and married Marie-Josephine, his boss's second daughter. Leon Agostini made a fortune in Coco and acquired Coblenz House from his brother-in-law, Captain the Honorable John Bellsmythe, for the remarkable sum of $19,200. Leon improved the property, which was said to have 99 windows, and in 1880 entertained Prince Albert and Prince George, sons of His Royal Highness Edward the Prince of Wales. Agostini devoted a great deal of his time to public duties and in 1879 founded the Trinidad and Tobago Chamber of Industry and Commerce. Among the several Coco estates owned by Leon Agostini was the San Jose estate at Caura. In 1900, during the last opulent days of the Coco planter's supremacy, Leon Agostini acquired a parcel of land in St. Clair, 29 Maraval Road, for £1,000. Building commenced in 1904 in accordance with his own design, Venetian style, and was completed four years later. By then, the building had changed hands. Our old buildings are part of us. We built them. Uh, sometimes you, you find that, that uh, people always say that the money may have come from abroad or the money may have come from the big plantations and the little people have nothing to do with it. But what I try to, to explain to everyone is we are the ones that built it. It's our grandparents who provided the uh, artistry, who actually did the fretwork, who nailed down the floors, who did the ceilings. We are the ones who did all the work. So the buildings are ours. And in a real sense, you can actually trace the history of the country through the architecture. This residence, the largest of the five private homes on the western side of the Queen's Park Savannah, was built of Barbados coral brought to Trinidad by Sloop. The final construction cost is said to have been $80,000, which was considered a very large sum in those days. The imported coral was cut locally, and Joseph Leon Agostini lost heavily in this line. His daughters, Stella and Blanche, contributed to the beauty of this gracious home in the decoration of wood paneling in the downstairs rooms. Leon Agostini lived there in extravagant style until his death in 1906. By 1905, however, he had found himself in financial difficulties and was forced to hand over the building to Gordon Grant as part of payment to them. The year after his death, his wife sold the property through William Gordon Gordon to Robert Henderson for $34,144. Robert Henderson took up residence with his family and during his ownership, a delightful touch in the furnishing of the interior was added to the refined dignity of the exterior. The name Whitehall was given to the residence by the Henderson family. Robert Henderson lived in Whitehall until his death in 1918. I remember my father particularly telling me about the dance floor. This would be on the fifth floor. And my brother and I visited the dance floor on several occasions. It was, a, I would say, a fairly big size. And they used to bring up an orchestra for their dances and parties. Now, this dance floor was surrounded by an outer veranda which I would imagine would be for drinks and eats and for dancing it would take place in the dance hall which was a nice timber floor and it seemed as, even though I was only about 13 or 14 but it was well sprung so I think very suitable for dancing even in those days. There's also this story obviously the um, girls or the women that attended these balls competed with each other in terms of dress and the story that one lady came in a dress made of two layers of net with fireflies in between so that the, the dress 
um, sparkled. Sometimes uh, in the restoration process, we come up with pleasant surprises. Uh, apparently, the daughters of the Hendersons, they were the second family to occupy the building and they actually finished the construction, played a pretty active part in the design of some of the finishes in the building. They actually designed the wallpaper, which was specially made for this room. This is the dining room. And you would find if this fruits, you find here fruits and flowers, and the fruits and flowers motif follows all the way through the house. It's in the fretwork, it's in the cast iron balconies, it's in the ceilings, it, it's in the main formal parlor across the hall. It, uh, it, it, it was like, almost like a theme throughout the building. Whitehall became the headquarters for the air raid police at the beginning of the Second World War. Under Robert Johnstone, with the arrival of the United States forces in Trinidad, Whitehall was commandeered from the heirs of Robert Henderson and was occupied by them from 1940 to 1944 at a rental of $440 per month. Being a leasehold property, a variation in the covenant was necessary to hold offices there. In 1944, the British Council rented and occupied the building for the next five years as a cultural center. The Trinidad Central Library, the Government Broadcasting Unit, the Trinidad Art Society and the Cellar Club all rented premises in the building. In 1949, the lease was not renewed to the British Council and the building remained empty until 1954 when it was purchased by the Trinidad Government for $123,000. In 1957, Whitehall was taken over by the pre-federal interim government until the Federation of the West Indies was launched in 1958. It housed the office of the Prime Minister as well as other government departments. For the next 35 years, Whitehall was never restored and confined to fall into sad disrepair. I think a lot of it is that the, um, the nationalism of, of and in, you know, the, the, the fervor of independence during the 1950s and 1960s um, probably worked against the, the respect for, for our heritage, whether it be architectural or, or artistic. I think one of the, um, perhaps one of the, the um, a more typical illustration would be to look at the artistic heritage, where there were really two basic movements for, of Trinidad nationalism in the 20th century, one in the 1930s, which coincided with the whole um, labor, labor movement in throughout the Caribbean, you know, whether it was Jamaica or Trinidad or wherever, and in particular through the Society of Trinidad Independence. And that, strangely enough, is, is where you, you also see architecturally, you know, developments of um, Trinidadian styles, um, as much as they were adaptations of European styles, in particular the Art Deco buildings. In 1993, a restoration program for Whitehall was implemented. In the course of the works, history inspired the restorators to return the rooms to their former state of beauty. What we did is, in the research process, we came up with photographs that actually showed us what the original chandeliers looked like. So we did, a, we did some more research and went through uh, various manufacturers from England and tried to find a chandelier that matched. And we had to do a little alteration to the one they, were going, they wanted to sell us that was in the catalog so that we could get it to look similar to the one that was, was in the, actually in this room. Architecture is history that you can feel, that you can touch, 
You can actually experience it. You know, you can walk into the room and, and feel the ambience because of the way the rooms are laid out. You know how the people live. You know what family life may have been like. Simply by the way the bedrooms are laid out, the way the rooms interact with each other, you can almost picture how, how these people live. And, and, this is, and it's absolutely amazing. It's better than any book, any picture. You have the real thing. And if you have the real thing, it's worth at least keeping the best of those heritage buildings. Whitehall, an interesting milestone in this country's history. It has presided over several economies. It has seen many cultures come and go. The French Creoles, Corsicans, the Americans, the English, and our own people make their mark here in this beautiful house. Thank you very much for looking at Land of Beginnings. I'm Jerry Besson, and good night. <laughs>